spreading to more city schools. It's a complete disaster. It's an emergency. The drastic measures this former teacher took to protect his own kids. First on Fox, an exclusive one-on-one -on -one with President Trump. His plan to tackle terrorism and the new era of threats facing America. Fox 45 News at 10 starts now. I ain't now. I ain't never nowhere. Love you. Hey, I love you. Oh my goodness, I miss you so much, girl. Tears and hugging, raw emotion. First on Fox, as a man shot in Edgewood last month, leaves shock trauma tonight and returns to his family. Good evening, I'm Kai Jackson. And I'm Jennifer Gilbert. The shooting rampage in Edgewood ended three lives and forever changed many others. One of those people is Enoch Sosa. Tonight, he returned to his family for the first time since that shooting took place. Keith Daniels joins us live from Northeast tonight. He was at that reunion. Keith. Okay, that's right. We are live in Northeast. Now it's a close-knit community hit hard by that shooting tragedy in Edgewood. One of their own struck down, but tonight, a happy homecoming. At his home in Northeast, it was a surprise reunion for his four children. The Jeep pulls up with Enoch Sosa inside, and then one by one, an embrace for the kids. His daughters. I ain't now. I ain't never nowhere. Love you. Hey, I love you. Oh my goodness, I miss you so much, girl. His sons. I miss you a lot. You been okay? Been good? Been good to mama? I love you, I man. I don't want to go nowhere now. Doctors released Sosa from shock trauma today. He was one of five people shot October 18th at his job at Advanced Granite Solutions in Edgewood. Three people were killed. Sosa is one of two people who survived. He took two bullets to the head. I'll tell you, everything I've been through, it, it's not easy. Not it, easy. It's not easy. Not easy. Sosa says he once thought of the suspect, Radi Prince, as a friend. Yeah, we, we talk each other, change cigarettes and whatever. Now the survivor, a father and husband, back with his family. I feel so blessed that he went through such a traumatic thing. And it, it, you know, he got better so fast. It's a miracle, miracle. It happens because all my friends are I'm not here and I still hear talk. How did they get here? I don't know, they make it here. Well, Sosa says he'll undergo outpatient rehabilitation. He says it will take about a year before things pretty much get back to normal for him. Meanwhile, Jose Gillen, the other survivor, remains at shock trauma. We're live now in Northeast. Keith Daniels, Fox 45 News. Keith, thank you. So happy for the Sosa family tonight with Enoch's return home. The 911 calls made just after that mass shooting at the Edgewood Granite Company reveal a lot of confusion, pain, even panic. Now, they offer a better picture of what happened inside of Advanced Granite Solutions in the seconds following the mass shooting. Yeah, I would go outside just to be in an open area because I don't know what kind of gas it is. Open the bay door. Now everybody stay out of the shop. I don't know where he's at. He ran back through my hotel. Towards the inside or the outside? The heat inside my hotel. The accused gunman, Radi Prince, is accused of killing three people and injuring two others in that shooting tonight. He remains behind bars in Delaware, where he's accused of shooting a sixth person who survived after fleeing Maryland. President Trump leaves for a very important trip to Southeast Asia tomorrow. This afternoon, Cheryl Ackeson, host of Full Measure here on Fox 45, had a one-on-one -on -one interview with the president to ask about some critical issues he leaves behind, including his reaction to the terrorist threat facing America. When it comes to Islamic extremist terrorism, do you think Americans are safer today than they were a year ago, two years ago? I think we are. I think that we have a much tougher vetting process. I call it extreme vetting. Uh, we are very strong with our vetting, but people can slip through. But I say as strong as we are, we have to get stronger. This person came in through a lottery, and not only came in through a lottery, but you have this whole system where you can 
bring people with you. Chain migration. It's horrible. It's horrible. Uh, somebody had mentioned he may have brought, and he only had a green card, but 23 people may have come in indirectly or directly through him. Now, I don't want those people in, family members, whoever they may be. I don't want them in here. You saw what he did. And you saw his evilness because they go back to the town or they go back to the area where he grew up, not where he's lived. Even you go back to the country, as I understand it. I mean, this is not the kind of people we want in the United States. So we have to get rid of chain migration. I feel like ordinary Americans, every time there's another terrorist attack with a similar pathology, they start to feel helpless now that there's been tough talk for years, and yet nothing concrete they can point to that will prevent another one. I think some people are actually adjusting their expectations and thinking this is our new way of life. I know they are, and a lot of people do that. And frankly, the Democrats have been absolutely terrible on immigration because they want anybody to come in. You know, they obstruct, make it very tough, and they want on immigration and crime. I mean, they want people to just pour in over the borders. That's not going to happen and we're stopping it. No, we want a merit-based system. I want people to come into our country, but it's got to be a merit-based system. And we can't take that for the norm. What you just said, we cannot just say, oh, well, it's going to happen. Let's get used to it. We cannot allow it to happen. And we're getting, I can tell you, the Trump administration is getting tougher and tougher and tougher. Well, that interview also includes questions on the special investigation into Russia, the nuclear threat from North Korea, and the promises of the new Republican tax plan. You can see the full interview this Sunday on Full Measure. Watch it right here on Fox 45 at 10 a.m. Sunday morning. Tonight we have new video of the school bus that was hit during the terror attack in New York City. Sebastian Sabachik was walking down the street when that attack happened. He started recording video as he approached the school bus. The cops okay? Can you tell what happened? We didn't have, we got the whoop them out. Yeah, yeah. Them, they're stuck in here. Oh, Okay? Oh my god. Are you okay? Five years. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Hey, I need. Can you call 911? I got. Oh my god. Oh my god. Okay. I, I, I need an ambulance right here. Right here. The, the guy T Bone. Come on. There's kids right there. New York's police commissioner says two children and two adults on the bus are among 12 people hurt in the attack. One student remains in critical condition. Now to the investigation into that attack. This afternoon, workers started placing concrete barriers on the bike path intersections to prevent a similar tragedy. We're now learning more about the suspect in the attack. Prosecutors say Saiful Saipov left ISIS literature, knives, and a stun gun in that rented truck. They also say he planned to kill even more people on the Brooklyn Bridge before he crashed into that school bus. The White House at one point considered classifying Saipov as an enemy combatant who could be shipped to the prison at Guantanamo Bay, but the White House has since backed away from that. Terrorists should know this. This administration will use all lawful tools at our disposal, including prosecution in Article III courts or at Guantanamo Bay. U.S. Attorney June Kim, who brought the federal charges, says the classification can always be added. A look at what has happened to past terror suspects. That's new at 10.30 tonight. We have breaking news tonight in a city in crisis. The city is approaching 300 murders for the year. Homicide investigators are at the scene right now of a shooting near the intersection of Moore's Run Drive and Radicky Avenue. That's in northeast Baltimore. When police arrived, they found a man who'd been shot in the head. No word tonight on a suspect nor a motive. Right now, the city is at 298 homicides. Last year at this time, Baltimore was at 260 homic homicides. Well, the safety of your family is becoming a big concern in Baltimore. A family attacked in the Inner Harbor, assaults during Halloween, and murders approaching a grave milestone. We have live team coverage of a city in crisis. Jeff Abel joins us in just a few minutes with how one neighborhood plans to keep people safe. But first, Baltimore City is just two hours away from starting its second ceasefire campaign. Shelly Orman is live right now in North Baltimore with more on that. Shelly? Well, Kaya, as the city is closing in on 300 homicides, those behind this ceasefire do not want to see that number grow. From the sanctuary of the church to the sidewalk, prayers and songs fill the streets in Cherry Hill. Or if you lead me, I can. 
cannot stray. Each month, dozens gather to walk singing through a different neighborhood. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Praying at spots affected by violence. We ask that you remove the taste for vengeance. This walk was led by St. Veronica Catholic Church. We're having a prayer walk, y'all. And we're praying for our community. People from parishes all over the city join members like Deborah Green. Safe street workers say three people have been shot in this part of Cherry Hill recently. Thankfully, none killed. We're praying nobody else will die. The walk comes on the eve of Baltimore's second ceasefire campaign, a call for 72 hours without violence. So it just so happens that there's been a spike, and so it is divine that it's happening right now. The movement's grown since the original ceasefire back in August. So, too, have the number of lives lost. We each just keep turning on our lights one by one into this darkness. That's what I want Sunday to feel like by the end of it is so many people recognize not just their individual light, but the light all around them that this city really is. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Did I get one? Now, the ceasefire starts at midnight and runs Friday through Sunday. Live in North Baltimore, Shelley Orman, Fox 45 News. Shelley, thank you. A city council member is calling for more police patrols at the Inner Harbor. There were several assaults and robberies on Halloween night spanning more than a mile from South Baltimore to the Inner Harbor. Police suspect the same pack of 10 to 15 juveniles is responsible for the attacks. Councilman Eric Costello represents the district and says the group is a threat to public safety. But some city youth advocates say jail time is not the answer. A roving pack of 10 to 15 juveniles anywhere in the city uh, carrying baseball bats and two by fours hurting people is unacceptable. I don't care if it's in the Inner Harbor. I don't care if it's in Upton. I don't care if it's in Bolton Hill. They need programs. They need resources and tools so that they can learn a better way, so that they can have better opportunities, so that they can have things to do to empower themselves. So far, city police have not made any arrests in the Halloween night attacks. A full 90 minutes of news is just getting off the ground. We have a new twist in grade changing allegations at Baltimore City Schools. Were you pressured by administrators to change grades? Oh, definitely. No holds barred. This former teacher sits down with our Project Baltimore investigators to reveal this and other things that have North Avenue answering some tough questions from us. A domestic dispute ends in one of the most violent attacks we've ever heard of. What happened? An emotional reaction from the neighbors tonight. And there is strong reaction here at Hopkins tonight. Should the school arm its security guards with guns? Details are straight ahead. And it was a warm day out there today. Looks like we're seeing mild temperatures tonight, 65 degrees. More warm air on the way than a cooler weekend ahead. That coming up in my forecast. The rising rate of crime around the Johns Hopkins Homewood campus is raising a lot of concern tonight. Jeff Abel is live on the Hopkins campus where there is also concern over one of the pros proposed solutions. Jeff. That's right, it seems pretty quiet out here on campus right now, but over the past two months, there have been more than 70 reported crimes on and around this campus. And while the campus is surrounded by security, there are questions tonight whether those security guards should be armed with guns. In the Hopkins community these days, guards are on the corner, but insecurity is in the air. We stopped walking our dogs at night. I mean, once it gets super dark, we just let them out in the back. On campus and near campus, the rate of burglaries and thefts, robberies and assaults have grown so alarming that last month an online petition surfaced calling for Hopkins to revamp its security. It was posted by the mother of a Hopkins student and it drew not only 452 supporters, but it also drew a quick response from campus administrators who told the petitioner that the school is now debating the issue of arming security personnel with guns and is touring three other campuses whose security personnel is currently armed. At Hopkins, that prospect is now turning heads. There isn't a simple fix, and I think the idea of just arming guards, individuals who happen to be there, is not necessarily the answer. Putting them more in this neighborhood makes me really nervous, but after becoming a mother, it's we are, for the first time living in Baltimore in eight years, nervous to take our dogs for walks. The campus isn't confirming nor commenting, 
but it has added 20 additional officers to its staff and vows it's determined to keep the campus safe. I think the right approach isn't necessarily showing more force, but showing more understanding. Well, tonight, administrators are telling parents they're not only considering and they're not only studying whether to arm its guards, but they're also examining whether to establish the school's own canine unit. We're live at Hopkins tonight. Jeff Abel, Fox 45 News. Project Baltimore's investigation into allegations of grade changing continues to expand as more teachers come forward. Project Baltimore lead investigative reporter Chris Papp sat down with a longtime teacher who says the state of city schools is an emergency. Chris? Well, Kai and Jennifer, the teacher we're about to introduce you to spent 25 years in city schools. He says at his school, not only were grades being changed, the learning environment was so toxic that he did something he never thought he'd do. Since August, Project Baltimore has interviewed a number of current and former teachers who say grade changing is happening at their schools. But fearing retaliation, none have been willing to reveal their identities. Until now. I'm angry. <laughs> and I think, you know, somebody's got to say something about it. Scott Miller Phoenix spent 25 years as a social studies teacher in Baltimore. Last year, he was laid off. And he calls the quality of education in city schools. It's a complete disaster. It's a disaster. It's an emergency. Phoenix tells Project Baltimore he worked at four city high schools where the heating systems would often break. He says the halls had plenty of violence, marijuana smoke, and rodents. This is video he took, but the classrooms had few supplies. And according to this teacher, all his high schools has something else in common, grade changing. As a teacher, were you pressured by administrators to change grades? Oh, definitely. I know other schools have done this, but in this particular school, this is what we were instructed to do. Northwestern High School closed in June, but Phoenix says when it was open, it was common for grades to be rounded up to the nearest five. So, for example, if a student earned a 56, which is failing, Phoenix said it would be rounded up to a 60, which is passing. That occurs all over the city. Administrators change grades. I think that they are scared to actually see and, and have demonstrated how poorly academically the kids are doing. Scared because of numbers like this. In his final year, Northwestern had more than 500 students, but 2017 state testing data analyzed by Project Baltimore shows that of the 371 students who took state tests, zero were proficient in math. Three students were proficient in English. Sahid Hill was the final principal of Northwestern. He now runs CASA, Knowledge Achievement Success Academy in West Baltimore. We reached out to him requesting an interview to discuss his former teacher's claims. But Principal Hill did not return our calls or emails. If I'm not willing to have my own kids in the school, I mean, what does that say? Meanwhile, Phoenix says public education is now so bad in Baltimore, he transferred his own kids out of the school system where he worked for a quarter century. I was very disappointed that I wasn't able to keep my kids in the school system that I taught in. And that bothered you? That drove me crazy. It was very upsetting. It was very upsetting. But you had to do the right thing for your kids. But w what choice did I have? Phoenix reached out to us on our hotline. We've had many teachers and parents from at least 15 city schools contact us to say grade changing is also happening in their schools. We are following up with as many of those leads as we can. So give us a call. Call our hotline. Send us an email. Go to foxbaltimore.com to follow our progress. I'm Chris Pabst, and this is Project Baltimore. We reached out to North Avenue about the allegations made by the former teacher that you just saw. They did not have an immediate comment. We had an absolutely beautiful November day today. It was. And if you like today, you're probably going to like tomorrow, too. Let's check in with meteorologist Venus Reed.
Yeah, it looks like we're seeing clearing skies through the night, but we could get some patchy fog out there through the late overnight, and then we'll clear up for part of the day tomorrow. And I say part of the day because we have this front moving in from the west. That's going to change our temperatures as we get into Friday night. So looks like for the day planner, a little morning fog, 62 degrees, lunchtime 69, plenty of sunshine. We get some clouds moving in after about 3, 4 o'clock with a chance for showers. Our high should be 75 degrees. Enjoy the afternoon before the rain arrives. I'll have a closer look at cooler air for the weekend coming up. Thank you, Vetus. We bring you more news than anyone else tonight. Alarming accusations against Hillary Clinton and the DNC by one of her most trusted advisors. Stunning claims by a respected Democratic strategist coming up. An incredible discovery at one of the seven wonders of the world. How scientists found something for the first time since the 1800s. And they're meant to save your life, but some fire extinguishers could cost you. Find out which ones are being recalled and why. We have a public safety alert for you right now that says your fire extinguisher could fail in an emergency. More than 40 million fire extinguishers made by Kitta are being recalled following a report by the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Now that recall includes 134 models sold from 1973 through August of this year. The company is offering a rep to replace defective models. You can find their website by going to newslinks at foxbaltimore.com. After more than 15 years of planning and design disagreements, crews finally break ground for a memorial honoring President Dwight D. Eisenhower. Eisenhower served as president from 1953 through 1961 after commanding Allied forces to victory in Western Europe during World War II. The memorial will be constructed at the base of Capitol Hill in D.C. and focus on the many international successes he achieved. The FDR memorial took 43 years, so I'd say we're way ahead of the timeline. The man was so humble that upon the surrender of the German army, his message back to Washington simply said, mission accomplished. The commission is hoping to complete the project in time to celebrate the 75th anniversary of VE Day in 2020. Bernie Sanders supporters are furious tonight after one of Hillary Clinton's closest allies drops a bombshell in a book. What Donna Brazil is saying about Hillary and the DNC that could cause major problems for both. I think we are soft on terror suspects, and our, our nation needs to wake up and understand how dangerous the situation is. One of America's most well-known senators weighs in on the New York City terror attack and what Congress should do now to prevent another one. But first, a break in the case of a man accused of shooting a Denver area Walmart last night, where not everyone made it out alive. And we see those temperatures cooling off a little bit after a mild day out there. It looks like we could get some patchy fog sitting at 65 degrees in Baltimore. We have another warm day on tap for tomorrow, but then the change occurs late afternoon. I'll show you that change in time and out for you next in my forecast. An update now on last night's breaking news, that Walmart shooting near Denver, Colorado. Police have arrested the man they believe shot and killed three people inside the store. 47-year-old Scott Ostrom was arrested near his apartment this morning. He didn't, he didn't run. Uh, he was in the vehicle. Uh, fortunately, we had a traffic light that was there, and that was traffic backed up because obviously we were in the middle of uh, traffic time. So that, that certainly helped us. Authorities identified Ostrom as the gunman after watching security footage. We also know the identities of the three people killed in the attack. They are 52-year-old Pamela Marquez, 66-year-old Carlos Moreno, and 26-year-old Victor Vasquez. Police are still investigating the motive behind the attack. Well, Anne Arundel County Police are trying to track down a hit-and-run driver who killed a 17-year-old. Kirsten Wingert Walco was leaving a house party in Severn Saturday morning when she was struck. The accident happened in the 7900 block of WBNA Road near Thompson Road. The teen was taken to the hospital to shock trauma where she died of her injuries this morning. Well, we're looking for anyone with information about this accident who may have seen the silver vehicle, broken headlight, broken windshield. Well, police say the suspect vehicle, believed to be occupied by attendees of the same party, was driving northbound at a high rate of speed. That vehicle is described as silver with tenant windows, a broken headlight assembly, and windshield damage. 
The Baltimore police officer, who could be fired for his role in Freddie Gray's arrest, began his defense today. The city wants Officer Caesar Goodson fired for not following department policy. Nine days before Freddie Gray was placed in the back of a prison of a police van without a seatbelt, a new policy was put in place mandating that detainees be seatbelted in. Goodson's defense says the new order wasn't communicated properly to him and other city officers. A quiet Frederick neighborhood awakens Thursday morning to find two bodies lying in the parking lot of a townhouse community. Police found a man and woman dead in the 6800 block of Acacia Court just after 5 a.m. Police quickly arrested a suspect, but residents who encountered the crime scene on their way to work said this kind of thing doesn't normally happen here. It's alarming <laughs> to hear that two people or, you know, anybody gets killed in your neighborhood. Uh, doesn't make you feel safe, for sure. Um, so uh, hopefully this is just an isolated incident. Police say the suspect and victims knew each other, but detectives are still investigating what motivated the attack. A terrible instance of domestic violence in Northern Virginia as a man attacks his wife before taking his own life. Belief police in Fairfax County say a 70-year-old man took an ax to his wife's face and neck. His stepdaughter was able to stop the attack, forcing him to retreat to the garage. That's where police found his body with self-inflicted wounds from a chainsaw. This spilled out into the front yard and people heard screaming. They called the emergency and uh, so, um, uh, and they notified me. I'm in charge of neighborhood watch here and so I uh, was concerned about what was going on. I went down and uh, just it couldn't, couldn't believe what I was hearing. Well, the woman is expected to recover, and police are not releasing the suspect's name to protect the woman's identity. House Republicans unveil a tax plan that roughly doubles the standard deduction allows pre-tax contributions of up to $18,000 a year to your 401k. It also lowers the corporate tax rate from 35% to 20% and cuts the tax rate on small business income to 25%. Republicans say the proposal is a bold pro-growth plan. Democrats say corporations are the biggest winners. For that Main Street business, making 62000 a year, working day and night and weekends, a tax cut of over $3,000. This is a shell game, a Ponzi scheme, that corporate America will perpetrate on the American people. Well, President Trump says he wants this bill on his desk by Thanksgiving. President Trump selects Jerome Powell as the next chair of the Federal Reserve. Powell is nominated to replace Janet Yellen, who is the first woman to hold the position. Powell currently sits on the Fed's Board of Governors and worked in the Treasury Department under President George W. Bush. If he's confirmed, Powell would be the first chair in almost 40 years without a Ph.D. in economics. He's strong. He's committed. He's smart. I'm both honored and humbled by this opportunity to serve our great country. Powell is not expected to make any radical changes to Fed policy. The former head of the Democratic National Committee skewers Hillary Clinton in a new book about the 2016 election. Donna Brazil now charges the system was rigged against insurgent candidate Bernie Sanders. You wanted to try to get reaction on the Donna yeah. Brazil revelations this morning, Mr. Sanders. Senator Bernie Sanders had no comment about Donna Brazil's new book. An excerpt of her memoir appears in Politico. In it, the former interim Democratic National Committee chair alleges that under her predecessor, Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz, quote, the DNC was rigging the system to throw the primary to Hillary. Thank you all for the great convention that we've had. Brazil reports the Clinton campaign raised $10 million to retire 80% of the party's bank debt, but wanted something in return. The agreement signed by Amy Dacey, the former CEO of the DEC and Robbie Mook of the Clinton campaign specified that in exchange for raising money and investing in the DNC, Hillary would control the party's finances, strategy, and all the money raised. Her campaign would help decide the communications director, and it would make final decisions on all other staff. The DNC also was required to consult with the campaign about all of the staffing, budgeting data, analytics, and mailings. This victory fund agreement had been signed in August 2015.
four months after Hillary announced her candidacy. There were lots of things that were shocking about it. One, the, the, the financial condition of the DNC. Two, the way the DNC then had to rely on the Clinton campaign uh, for the money and the resources to continue even operating. In a statement, Wasserman Schultz told Fox News she's proud of her work at the DNC and urged Democrats to stay focused on the progressive Madam agenda. Secretary, any response to what Donna Brazil is saying? The Clinton campaign would not respond to Fox's questions, nor would the Federal Election Commission disclose if it's investigating Brazil's allegations. Brazil said she searched for other evidence of a rigged primary and found none. I'll be asking some questions as well, along with my friend Roland Martin of TV One. The excerpt neglects to mention that Brazil used her dual role as a CNN commentator to steer CNN debate questions to Clinton in advance. For months, Brazil denied having done it. Where did you get it? I, 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 you know, as a Christian woman, I understand persecution, but I will not sit here and be persecuted because your information is totally false. In an essay for Time magazine last May, Brazil belatedly acknowledged having steered debate questions to Hillary Clinton. She says it was, is, it was a mistake she will forever regret. Turning now to our weather and this really warm weather for the beginning of November. It is really nice. We know it can't last, but we'll take it while we can get it, Vetus. Yeah, it looks like we're seeing nice conditions out there. And overnight tonight, it's going to cool off down into the lower mid-60s. And we could get a little bit of patchy fog that will linger for tomorrow morning's commute. So be prepared for that around 8 a.m. Lunchtime, we get more sunshine. Temperatures around 69 to 70 degrees. It should be a pretty nice afternoon. Lunch outdoors, I think it should be pretty nice. But keep the umbrellas nearby because as we get after about 3, 4 o'clock, the clouds are moving in. And we could get some spotty showers. Only about a 30% chance, but we could see a high of about 75 degrees before the front moves through. Later in the evening, temperatures will definitely drop for your Friday night plans as it gets colder behind that front. So let's talk about your weather here, timing everything out towards the weekend. Sky Cam looking at the Inner Harbor, very beautiful lit up there. Temperatures at 65 degrees, our winds are calm, and it looks like those temperatures will hang right around in that range through the overnight. 63 in Westminster, 62 in Columbia. Uh, down in uh, Chestertown, looking at 60 degrees, 64 in Easton as we get up to Bel Air. Right around 61 degrees, 58 in Elkton, 63 in Conkeysville. Looks like we will see dry conditions for the start of the day. Just a little patchy fog. High pressure is helping bring up the warm air ahead of this cold front that's moving through Detroit right now and down through Indiana. Looks like that's going to be arriving as we get into the late evening, giving us a chance for some spotty showers. But it's running into the drier air that's ahead of it. But nonetheless, it will be a game changer temperature wise. So we'll try to get a, another warm day for the afternoon before those temperatures drop on down. So timing it for the future scan here. A little bit of patchy fog to start us off in the morning, 7 a.m. Sun comes out relatively quickly. We'll warm up nicely through the afternoon. And here come those clouds right around lunchtime. This is 1 o'clock when I stopped it. So you can see a little bit of cloud cover, some showers back to the west of us, kind of scattered. So maybe not everybody will see it, but about a 30% chance for those showers as the front's moving through. It's going to drop our temperatures down in the mid late afternoon. And then as we get into the overnight, once the front pushes on off to the east by 8 p.m., our temperatures are going to go on down. So if you have plans to go out, it'll be dry, but it'll be much colder out there compared to what we saw earlier in the day. So these temperatures overnight will be down in the 40s as you go out. So you're going to need to get that coat right back on out. Saturday morning, we'll start off with a little bit of a chill in the air in the low 40s, and then we'll see plenty of sunshine through the morning into the afternoon. But the next round of rain moves up out of the south as you see 430. So any plans you have for Saturday, going out shopping, running to the mall, kids have a game, whatever it is, looks like we'll see dry start to the day. But after about 435 o'clock, We'll start to getting more rain moving in for Saturday's evening, Saturday night. Events are going to be kind of wet out there around the city. So here's what it looks like for the extended forecast. 75 the high for tomorrow in the afternoon. The rain starts moving in probably around 4 o'clock, 3 to 4 o'clock. And then it looks like we'll start to clear up Friday night. And then Saturday morning we start out nice and dry. It's going to be much cooler, only in the upper 40s. 58 the high for Saturday. And then those showers move in after about 4 or 5 o'clock on Saturday into Saturday night, into Sunday morning. It still sticks around. We're at 68 degrees. We start warming back up. 68 on Sunday, Monday, 72 degrees, looking at warmer temperatures. Then we cool down to behind the next front, back down into the 50s for Wednesday and Thursday. So we're getting a little bit of a roller coaster ride of temperatures over the next couple of days. Another closer look at your weekend forecast coming up in just a little bit. Back to you guys. All right, Vitas, thank you. Remember, you can always send us your pictures and videos. If you see interesting weather or anything else interesting in your neighborhood, just open up your Fox 45 News app and click See It, Send It, and we might show your pictures live during our newscast.
Still to come tonight, you might call it a pyramid scheme, a great mystery at one of the seven wonders of the world. But first, lawmakers weigh in a day after a lone wolf terrorist is accused of attacking uh, in New York City, two days actually. How can we prevent another one? Find out right after this quick break. We have breaking news tonight out of Baltimore City. Police are now confirming tonight that there were four fatal shootings in the city of Baltimore. One of the fatal shootings was this one on Moore's Run Drive in Northeast Baltimore. There was also one at 2.30 this afternoon along California Boulevard. That's in Northwest of Baltimore. And one at 7.40 this evening along South Collins Avenue in Southwest Baltimore. And in East Baltimore at 8.45 this evening, a shooting took place around Morris Street. Right now, there are 302 homicides in the city of Baltimore. Last year at this time, there were 260 murders. Tonight, we take a closer look at how past terror suspects have been treated. We would like to ask you, should anyone who commits a terrorist act in the United States face the death penalty? Tell us what you think by going to foxbaltimore.com slash vote. And results will update live during this story. Chief political correspondent Scott Thuman shows us the lengthy process and how some suspects are still awaiting their day in court years later. Whether at often scrutinized Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, or even through traditional United States courts, President Trump complains the process hasn't been fast or tough enough. We also have to come up with punishment that's far quicker and far greater than the punishment these animals are getting right now. Convictions are anything but quick, specifically at Gitmo, where charges don't have to be immediately filed and cases linger for years. I think we are soft on terror suspects, and our, our nation needs to wake up and understand how dangerous the situation is. We have American standards, and that's a symbol we should show the rest of the world. Otherwise, if we start acting like them, they're just going to make it easier for them to recruit. The alleged 9-11 mastermind, arrested in 2003, has had more than 20 hearings so far at Gitmo, but may not see trial until at least next year. A suspect from the 2000 attack on the USS Cole, which killed 17 U.S. sailors, has been in court proceedings for six years now. And even those convicted inside the U.S., like the 2009 underwear bomber held in a Colorado prison, is now suing the government, claiming he's subjected to food and treatment forbidden by his religion. President Trump demanding swift and more severe punishment tweeted would love to send the NYC terrorist to Gitmo, but the process takes longer than the federal system. He should get the death penalty. Hundreds of terror suspects have been convicted in traditional U.S. courts while at Guantanamo Bay. That number is under a dozen. In Washington, I'm Scott Thuman. Well, archaeologists in Egypt discover a hidden chamber in one of the seven wonders of the world, the Great Pyramid may be more than 4,500 years old, but it still managed to hide a space, listen to this, the size of an airplane within its walls. Scientists use a device that sends cosmic rays through the pyramid to search the structure without damaging it. It's the first new area discovered in the pyramid since the 19th century. Governor Larry Hogan today announced a plan to prepare more Maryland residents for jobs in the field of information technology. The governor's plan includes a new executive order, proposed legislation, and five or five million dollars in new education funding. Much of it is designed to encourage more women to enter the computer science workforce. Our universities and uh, colleges are currently projected to produce qualified graduates to fill only 29% of these jobs. Uh, and we are seeing a, sh a shocking lack of uh, gender diversity in this growing sector. Governor Hogan announced a partnership with the Girls Who Code organization, which provides after school programs for girls in sixth through 12th grades. All right, time for a look at your detailed weekend forecast. So glad it's here. Here's <laughs> Chief Meteorologist Vitas Reed. Vitas. Yeah, well, the first part of it, definitely you want to be outdoors, and that starts with Friday. Tomorrow afternoon, we'll get some sunshine up into the mid-70s. By lunchtime, we'll see a high of 75. We'll get evening showers overnight uh, in the afternoon, excuse me, then the overnight for Friday night will be dry. Now, early Saturday, we'll start off 
nice and dry, but then those showers start moving in. Our temperatures are cooler. Highs only 58 degrees, so rain will be after about 4 o'clock on Saturday through Saturday night. So it looks like a wet plan for Saturday night, and then Sunday morning that uh, shower sticks around. Highs only 68 degrees. They start going back up, so you see the coolest day of the weekend will be Saturday at 58 degrees. The first part of the day sunny, second part of the day on Saturday we'll have some rain, and then Sunday a little bit warmer. Back to you. All right, Vita, thank you. Do you know someone who's making a difference in the community? You can recognize their efforts by nominating them for Fox 45's Pay It Forward. They could win $500. Go to foxbaltimore.com and click on contest to read the rules and tell us what someone is doing to improve the lives of people around Baltimore. Coming up in just 10 minutes on the Late Edition, first on Fox, the emotional reunion between a victim of last week's workplace shooting in Hartford County and his family at home. And the search is on for the people accused of causing chaos on campus tonight. More Johns Hopkins students are looking over their shoulders. How has Joe Flacco come back so quickly from his concussion? Does toughness have something to do with it? Offensive coordinator Marty Morningweg talks about that next in Sports Unlimited. Things were back to normal, or what passes for normal, on the practice field in Owings Mills today. That's because that tall dude wearing number five was called as signals for the Ravens. One day after being removed from the NFL's concussion protocol, Joe Flacco practiced for the second consecutive day. After taking that devastating hit to the head last Thursday, Flacco insists he's fine, and his coordinator says there's a very good reason for that. He's got that mental toughness. He's also very, very tough physically. You know, he's been... He's been through, you know, a major knee and then a back this year and then and then this hit, you know, and I've done this for a while. And as I've gotten uh, more and more experience, the toughness and the character of really any player goes a long, long way. Those things are important and Joe's got all of that. Elsewhere, when the Ravens face the Colts December 23rd, they'll be looking at a backup quarterback. We learned today that Andrew Luck has been placed on injured reserve ending his season. Luck hadn't played all year after undergoing off-season shoulder surgery. And when the Ravens face Houston in three weeks, the Texans will have a backup quarterback as well. That guy, Deshaun Watson, tore his ACL at practice this afternoon. He will have season-ending surgery. It's a shame because the rookie out of Clemson was having a bang-up year leading NFL quarterbacks in rushing yards. And his 19 touchdown passes has him tied for the NFL lead in that category. Backup Tom Savage takes over. They've signed Matt McGloin to be his backup. Our Morgan Atz has spent the day with the Ravens at Owings Mills. Her report at 11.30 as Sports Unlimited continues. Up next on Fox 45, ever want to own something from your favorite Hollywood movie? Find out how to get your own piece of the silver screen when we come back. Hello, I'm Mark Hyman. It's time for another go at welfare reform. Here's what's happening behind the headlines. A bill was introduced in the House earlier this year that deserves consideration. It reforms the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP. Most people refer to this by the old program name of food stamps. The proposed legislation is simple. Non-elderly, able-bodied adults without dependent children would be required to look for work in return for SNAP benefits. Currently, there are nominal requirements for these recipients to seek employment, but current law allows for widespread waivers. If enacted, this bill would close the waiver loophole. It's perfectly acceptable to hold able-bodied adults without dependent children to a different and higher standard than parents with children, the elderly, and the disabled. Critics may argue that only about a third of SNAP recipients are healthy, childless adults. This proposed legislation wouldn't amount to gigantic savings, they'd say. Perhaps, but this misses the larger point. Welfare shouldn't be a one-way street where recipients get benefits without making serious efforts to find work. To comment, go to BehindTheHeadlines.net. I'm Mark Hyman. you could sort of be a part of your favorite movie yes. well now you can take <laughs> steps toward your hollywood dreams that's right more than 150 movie props and celebrity items are going to auction props on sale include the mary poppins umbrella a uniform worn by tom hanks and forrest gump 
and the ticket won by Leonardo DiCaprio's character in Titanic. There's also plenty of personal items available, like listen to this, Elvis's 1957 pink Cadillac mm. and clothing worn by Jackie Kennedy, Marilyn Monroe, and Michael Jackson. Collectors can start bidding online November 11th. Ain't never nowhere. Love you. Love you. Get out.